Hi, Shara. Okay. Hello. So, I will be starting the Facebook Live at the same time. So everyone can smile <laughs> for the beginning okay. of this live session. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Hmm. And we are live on Facebook. Hi, good afternoon, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Welcome to the second live TechVG session. TechVG is a global impact driven organization to uh, in place, sorry, to empower people, displace people through technology. We're a community of volunteers, organizing events, running programs, building projects with and not just for refugees. In 2020, yeah, March, we started TechVG's Data Hub. It's a collaborative and collective effort to monitor the impact of COVID-19, direct or indirect, on displaced communities. We've been collecting data, not only on the spread of the virus, but on actions taken by grassroots organizations, on the ground, governments, and concrete ways to support displaced communities today. So we list those the ways people are doing this either physically or remotely. It's a collective effort done by about 70 contributors from Australia to Colombia. And there's so far mapped situations in 40 plus countries. You can see all this on techfugees.com. You can find the link there to our data hub. So we have these live sessions now. It's our second one, the open public regular events to raise awareness about what's happening in a specific geographic area. Today it's the Americas, and we want to promote existing actors working with the space communities and encourage people, anyone, anywhere to act. So thanks for joining us. We hope you find our session good today, and we hope you'll come back for more when we go to different areas of the world. So the format of this, this event today, three parts, regional, national, and then solution pitch uh, with eight minutes presentation. So without further ado, I'll move you on to Elise from TechVGs, who will talk to you about the main points of today. Elise. So Elise is going to discuss the situation in the Americas. Um, she has some data on CDC and also on our guests. But whilst we're waiting, I can always, um, I can tell you more. So. I was muted. Ah, there you go. So in March, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, issued an order which prohibits the entry of certain individuals who need processing at the Mexican and Canadian borders. This includes asylum seekers. The order was extended for 30 days in April. On the 19th of May, this policy has now become indefinite until coronavirus ceases to be a public health threat which has huge effects on asylum seekers and refugees. Our speakers will talk more in detail about what is going on, but a quick roundup of the situation is. So according to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, also known as ICE, there are 1,392 people in immigration detention in the US who have tested positive for COVID. These numbers are to be taken with a grain of salt as testing is still low and ICE is not known for its transparency. Officially, two people have passed away, but I cannot begin to estimate the true number of deaths linked to COVID and detention centers. It must be noted that getting information is very difficult. After detainees video chatted family members showing the conditions they were in, with images being shared with the media, I shut down the internet access in many of the detention centers, making external communication extremely difficult, essentially censoring these images. Due to the closure of the border and sped up deportations, there are more and more people in informal camps at the border who are at great risk of COVID and violence at the hands of the cartels. Sexual assault, kidnapping, and torture are rife. The Migration Protection Protocol, also known as the MPP or the Remain in Mexico policy, means that asylum seekers wait for their day in court in Mexico. 
This is contrary to the international norm of non refoulement. Asylum court dates have been pushed back to April 2021. People on the ground have said that Matamoros on the border is one of the worst displacement camps they have ever seen in the world, all within the eyesight of a Walmart, just on the other side of the border. ICE is still deporting people, including minors. With more than 200 flights since February to countries with inadequate healthcare systems, such as Haiti, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. Mexico is also deporting people and children to these countries. Many organizations are working to try and alleviate the suffering of refugees and asylum seekers on both sides of the border, including the three we are lucky to have with us today. Welcome to Ana Saiz Valenzuela from Sin Fronteras, based in Mexico City, Dr. Bonnie Arzuaga from Doctors for Camp Closure, based in the US, and Marcela Valiente from Connect to Doctors, also based in Mexico City. Thanks so much for being with us. I will now hand the floor to Anna from Sin Thank you very much. This is a great uh, honor for me to be sharing with you all uh, what all the work we're doing from uh, from Mexico City. Sin Fronteras is a nonprofit organization, non-religion and non-political, that is working for uh, the sake of migrants and refugees since 24 years ago in Mexico City. Uh, we we attend people from with psychological professionals and also lawyers to try to help them figure out what's the best solution for their own plan of life and help them uh, have access to their rights in Mexico City. What we have noticed lately is that it's not COVID what's worrying the most of of our migrants and asylum seekers they are really really wor worried about the same problems they have been worried but they're more increasingly uh, noticing barriers to have access to documents to have access to healthcare and to have access to jobs or a place to live. So they have just the same problems, but let's call them like magnified. So that is was very shocking for our team because COVID is not their main uh, concern. So we are trying to, to help them with a relief for uh, because of some of them that had already found a job in Mexico City, now they lost it. If they have a place to live, now they're in risk of losing it. And so we are worried on on how the situation has been wor wor worsening for them increasingly and very rapidly. Uh, Sin Fronteras uh, works directly with more or less uh, one 1500 people yearly uh, and we do give give this kind of advice to people for long term it's not like a short date uh, people that come to sin fronteras start um, receiving this uh, counseling legal counseling or psychological aid uh, and we and also they have access to Spanish lessons in our facilities. Uh, according to uh, the track numbers they, they, they register in the United States, we have received approximately 65,000 people under the MPP program. That is, they this is considered to be a very, very risky program that it's only, uh, it's only showing how access to asylum seekers in the US is becoming more and more difficult and more closed. And it's very interesting to know that only if uh, only 4% of migrants under MPP cases have been able to find representation in Mexico, whereas those staying in the United States have access to lawyers more or less on 32% of them. And 89% uh, of asylum seekers uh, allowed to, to remain in the United States and wait for the turn in court, they 89% of them show to their audience show up to their audiences, whereas 
50% of the asylum seekers waiting in Mexico managed to get to the court uh, in the United States timely to, to have their cases revised. So the, the shocking figure is that not even 1% is acquiring or is getting relief in the United States under this MPP program. So it's just uh, pretending to be to have access or to have a way of proceeding their their applications, and uh, you have to add up onto these sixty four thousand or, or, or almost sixty five thousand people were waiting in Mexico under MPP. There are there is also this called metering this system where the people in different in more in 12 border points they go and uh, put their name on the list so they can expect a turn to get in the united states and have an audience with the judge to ask for asylum under the metering uh, system we have more or less 1400 400 asylum seekers and uh, a big percentage of it, probably more or less half of it, are Mexican asylum seekers that want to cross the border to the United States. So there is this uh, very uh, complicated situation that when people probably crossed a couple of countries and Mexico and managed to arrive to the US to ask for asylum, they do have to uh, uh, put their name on this on this list and wait. They basically are in Tijuana, so you have there the all the persons in the north of the city, as as you were mentioning, for example, in Matamoro. Now you can find more or less three hundred people that are waiting in the border in Mexico City. There's also a shocking data from med, uh, Doctors Without Borders, this French organization that has documented how nine in every 10 persons on their MPP had suffered an attack uh, to their, to their, to their, uh, an attack such as a kidnap or something in, in their family. So, uh, we that's a very, very complicated situation. So people it's afraid is afraid to stay waiting in the border. So they're starting to move around the country without proper documentation, which is also uh, uh, pose them in risk of even of deportation of or uh, also uh, being kept in a detention facilities, which is I think it's it's interesting to to tell you that in mexico we have 53 detention centers in in all along the country the biggest facilities are in the south of uh, the country and uh, for example so you can more or less have a uh, can imagine how many people are detained only this year were detained in these different detention facilities uh, 300, 3,000, 30,614 persons. Among them were 4,639 minors, under which of them were 142 were unaccompanied without any relatives. It's important also to note that the concept of unaccompanied children for the US law and for the Mexican law is different. If they are in Mexico, probably with a cousin or an aunt, they will be considered to be accompanied children, not in the US, which they have to be with their direct parents. So that's why the number is a lot less. But if we think on, on for example, how many persons were detained under on in 2019 in Mexico were 186,750 detainees, basically in Chiapas, Veracruz, and Tabasco, which are states at the so southern part of the country. And most of them, 157,000, were from Central America, basically, although they were also 
people from Asia or Africa. And uh, along that, along uh, during 2019, there were 51,999, well, 52,000 uh, minors detained in uh, Mexican facilities. From those facilities, most of them are returned to their countries. Uh, we're talking about 141, 223 persons deported or returned to their countries, which we don't really know how many of them were offered to ask for asylum in Mexico and which were not under an individualized analysis, whether their life would be at risk at returning at their home countries. Uh, under that situation were 42,000 minors. So that is something we are very worried about. Is the conditions on detention centers in Mexico, um, but has not ever happened what, what happened in the US that the detention facilities were filmed and were open, were, were known to the public how the detention facilities conditions are in Mexico. That has never been allowed. So the conditions under those detention centers are really, really precarious, precautious and, and not, they don't have facilities to have families separated from men or LGBT persons are also mixed with all the, all the, they don't have special facilities. So that is something that it's always posing them risks. We had the very sad uh, death of a Guatemalan girl last year, and we did a, a legal action against it because uh, they don't have the, the, the access to, to, to medical attention or the facilities are not. Correct. Oh, and just to, to close, because my time is up, is we are very worried because we see all the time that Mexico has not a, 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 pol a migratory policy of our own. We are always reacting to the U.S., uh, uh, what the U.S. is posing to us. So that is very complicated to make sure to guarantee human rights for migrants and refugees. I hope I give a quick overview of, of, the, of the size of, of, of the phenomena we're facing. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, so much for this very interesting insight and worrying insight. Um, so we've got a couple questions for you from both TechPGs and our wonderful people watching. So the first question um, from the audience is, can you detail what MPP is, please? Absolutely. MPP is called Migrant Protection Protocols or Remain in Mexico. What people have to do is they go to an American court, they ask for asylum, and the judge asks uh, this asylum seeker to go and wait for their turn uh, to have their next hearing revised in a court in the United States, you have to remain in Mexico. So even though you are not from Mexico, or even if you're from Mexico and you are afraid of a certain risk posed to, to your life or your family. So it's very inhumane because that causes people great, great distress and puts them in, in a lot of risk for criminal bans and also extortions from Mexican uh agents let's say so that's 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 the program under mpp at least i cannot hear you so i need to figure out how to unmute myself so our second question we have from our audience and thank you for your reply about the mpp is does mexico receive any funding from the us for in quotes hosting migrants not at all not at all, or or is something that is not openly discussed uh, uh, in the Mexican government. So we don't know of any any. We don't know what is the exchange about about this receiving all these person persons because Mexico says uh, the official um, version is that we do it on humanitarian reasons. 
But the thing is, we are violating their own human rights by receiving them in Mexico and risking their, 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 their cases in this way. Again, unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry, I will get better at this. So the next question that we have for you is, we know that Sin Fronteras has an app to help asylum seekers and refugees, and we are just wondering if you could tell us quickly about that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, maybe I can even share how it's look. It's an app uh, that we developed uh, three years ago with uh, a prize from Google. And uh, let me try to share it. But the thing with the app is that we have been, we, we thought that it would be wise to to help people from their own places of origin so they can find information uh, for their stay in Mexico to know their rights and to know where they have access to all different uh, uh, rights they have in Mexico. We have this web app that you can download from Android or from iOS. We have from January to May this year registered 8,400 users. Uh, and basically, our most uh, downloading comes from Android, Android devices and from Mexico, the United States, Peru, El Salvador, Honduras, Venezuela, Argentina, Chile and Colombia. And in the app, you can find, um, I'm, I'm trying to, to share, but it's called Contigo Sin Fronteras. And you can down, download it and use it without uh, an internet connection. So you, you can use it both ways. Now I have it here, I will gladly share, and I will post the link so you can find it. The important thing on, on the app is also that many, many of the persons don't know if they can, um, if they, they have the right to, to, to ask for asylum, so we have also developed some certain tests so people can know if they would if, if why are the reasons because of, of their, they left their country and how can they prepare their trip to mexico and also also if, if you are in mexico how can you request asylum you can find it in english in french and in spanish uh, for how to get your papers and also here we have an maps where you can find shelters or legal aid offices or wherever you you whatever you 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 need as a as a person traveling or or looking for asylum in mexico so i would gladly put the the link so you can so you can uh, know the app and also help us promote it so person because for us, uh, information is very, very important to have accessible information is very important that people to defend themselves and know, know how to access to their rights. And also, we noticed that many people didn't read quite uh, properly or they had many gaps. So that's why we have also a lot of information in audio. So people can can listen to them calmly without having to have an, an internet connection. So it would be very interesting if you could see it and and and, and tell us, give us some feedback, please. Thank you, Anna, for that. That was super interesting. And I see that we have other questions in the chat, but we are going to move on to our next next speakers as they are also as fascinating as Anna is. Um, and so, Anna, if you have the time, if you want to answer a couple questions in the chat, or we'll try and come back to them um, later. Um, Absolutely, I'll do it. Thank uh, you very much for your time. Ali, sorry, could I just ask one very quick question to Anna? I wonder, just from the tech perspective, uh, what the primary needs are uh, for Sin Fronteras and also for refugees. Okay, first of all, we noticed that people have a problem in accessing internet. They don't. Okay. For them, it's, it's very costly, so we're trying to give them some support so they can buy 
uh, or extend airtime. a bit on their yes airtime and and so that's a problem and also we are managing to have these our Spanish lessons linked in some kind of of of, of free streaming platform so people can have access to their Spanish lessons as, as well so access is not as easy as we might think for many refugees and migrants. Sometimes they have to look for a Wi-Fi wi points or also uh, invest on data for their, their phone plan. Okay, so if their, anybody wants device. to help today, yes. perhaps they can help yes. you with Wi-Fi. Yes. That would be very, very interesting to put some Wi-Fi points. That's something we have to do. Where we promote the app, we try to make accessible a Wi-Fi point so people can download it or or even chat with their, their friends. Also in our office for for persons, for the people, it's very important to have access to the Wi-Fi or, or our computers to communicate with their loved ones or their home computers. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. So now I'm going to introduce um, Bonnie Arzuaga, Dr. Bonnie Arzuaga, I'm sorry, from Without, for Camp Closure, who is going to present to us um, her organization and the work they have been doing in detention centers in the U.S. Just let me know when you like need to switch your slides around. Sure. Thank you so much, Elise. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. okay yes. Great. Thank you. Um, so I'm Dr. Bonnie Arzuega. I'm one of the co-founders of a group called Doctors for Camp Closure in the United States. And I'll go into a little bit more about our organization a little bit later in my presentation. Um, but I'm a pediatrician. I'm based in Boston, Massachusetts, and that's where I'm calling in from right now. And um, I was asked to speak today about the issues uh, related to immigration and detention in the United States, and particularly in the past few months um, during this coronavirus pandemic and how that has affected not only um, the detention centers themselves, but also um, what's going on at the southern border of the United States and our work uh, with Doctors for Camp Closure. Uh, so Elise, can you just uh, go to the first slide? There we go. Thank you. Um, so because I'm coming uh, from a medical perspective, I just thought that I'd give all the listeners just a very brief overview of coronavirus, um, otherwise known as COVID-19, to give you a little bit of context about um, what the issues are currently in the detention centers and why they are so urgent right now. Um, so the novel coronavirus or COVID-19 um, for which we're in the middle of a pandemic right now is a new respiratory virus. Um, it is a virus that affects all ages. So every person from infancy through older adulthood are susceptible to contract the virus and become ill. The virus itself is primarily transmitted through large droplets. Um, so that's generated by activities such as coughing, sneezing, um, breathing hard if you're, for example, running or exercising or even speaking. And when we engage in these activities of coughing or sneezing or speaking, the droplets that are generated from our mouths that can go out into the air can travel anywhere between six feet and 27 feet. Um, and that's important for something that I will discuss in a minute called social distancing. Um, what's also unique about this virus in particular and what makes it so dangerous is that asymptomatic people are contagious. Um, so people walking around um, without symptoms who don't even know that they have contracted the virus are able to spread the virus to other people. Uh, the incubation period for this virus, so that is uh, the time period in which someone has contracted the virus, but is asymptomatic, um, but still can be spreading it is anywhere between two and 14 days. And what we know is that the average <clears throat> incubation period is about five days. Like I said before, it's mostly spread by droplet inhalation. So droplets coming out of one person's mouth going into another person's face, but it's also uh, spread by touching contaminated surfaces um, and then touching your nose, mouth, or eyes. Or also uh, we believe right now that it can also be spread by a stool. Um, so if you think about public toilets or toilets that are being shared by multiple people, um, if one person is infected and using the toilet, that is also a potential mode of spread. The way that we kill the virus is just through basic disinfectants. So things that um, many people may have access to in their private homes, such as bleach, 
uh, hydrogen peroxide or other antibacterial cleansers are actually very good at cleaning um, and killing the virus. And the virus will be killed in under one minute if these uh, disinfectants are used. So I um, said that I would speak a little bit about uh, social distancing and why that's important. Um, so in public health, we talk about this um, form of measurement called R naught, and R naught basically means how many people um, can be infected by one person who is infected. So what is the spread of the virus? Um, and it's always um, it's always represented as a number. So the R naught for COVID nineteen is two point two. So what does that mean? That means that for every person who has COVID, they can uh, potentially infect about two and a half people on average. Uh, that's important because influenza, which is one disease that COVID has been um, sort of compared to a lot in recent months, um, the R naught for influenza is half that. So if you have the flu, you only are able um, on average to infect about one to one and a half people. Um, and so what that means is that for COVID itself, the number of infected people um, increases on a very steep exponential scale. And we saw that here in the United States in places like New York City, uh, New Jersey, <clears throat> and some prisons as well. Um, as we know, there's no universally approved treatments yet. We're still working on that in the medical community. So prevention is, is still very critical at this stage. Elise, can you uh, advance slide, please? Thank you. Um, so to segue into how that relates to the detention facilities in the United States, specifically immigration detention facilities, um, for people who may be unfamiliar, there are three types of detention facilities in the United States. Those run by Customs and Border Protection, or CBP. Those run by Immigration and Customs Enforcement, otherwise known as ICE, uh, and the facilities that are run by the Office of uh, Refugee Resettlement, or ORR. ORR typically um, runs facilities for unaccompanied minors, and so uh, they are holding children in those facilities. Um, as Elise alluded to earlier, ICE itself uh, is not very transparent, and so uh, these numbers may or may not be totally accurate, but this is the best that we have based on um, ICE's own reporting, as well as some investigatory reporting from media and also from uh, lawyers around the United States. We think that right now there's anywhere between 30,000 and 40,000 people currently being held in ICE detention facilities specifically. Um, what has been happening over the past couple of months uh, due to COVID is that the number of people who have been held in ICE uh, facilities has been decreasing, uh, mostly because of litigation. So attorneys who have been fighting for uh, people to be released who have underlying medical conditions who may be susceptible for getting very sick um, due to COVID. However, this is not exactly um, good news for us because what we know is that most of the people who are being released are not being released out into communities. They're actually either being transferred from facility to facility in the United States, um, many times secretly. So attorneys uh, who are working with people may not even know which facility their client has been transferred to around the United States. Um, but they're also being deported. Um, and they're being deported to countries like Haiti and Guatemala. Um, and this is important because people are being transferred to facilities and also being deported who are not necessarily being tested for COVID. And so there is a potential that ICE is spreading disease from asymptomatic people or even at, at some reports symptomatic people, um, not only within the United States among facilities, but also to other countries. Um, the numbers of COVID cases in ICE detention facilities are always rising. Um, I know that publicly they have admitted to two deaths, but there is actually at least four known deaths um, from COVID directly, as well as one death of an elderly South Korean man in California who committed suicide a couple of weeks ago um, because of a fear of contracting COVID. Um, so there's at least five COVID related deaths in ICE facilities in the last three weeks. Um, the reason why it's so dangerous to be in detention is because what we spoke about earlier with social distancing, um, social distancing and proper hygiene are not um, possible inside detention. So there are many reports um, that we've gotten directly, but also that attorneys have gotten in the media as well, 
that there is a lack of soap. Um, there's a lack of clean linens. We've gotten reports from people in detention that they are only getting new uh, bed sheets about once a month, if that. Um, there's no hand sanitizer and there's also no disinfectant. So even though disinfectants are very um, kill the virus very easily, people don't have access to the disinfectants within detention centers. Uh, we also know that solitary quarantine is being used, and I think this was alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, so people who are infected or believed to be infected with COVID are being put in solitary confinement um, many times for prolonged periods of time, um, which in itself from a public health and mental health uh, perspective is um, akin to torture. So Physicians for Human Rights, which is another American um, organization of physicians, has um, come out and declared that solitary confinement for people for prolonged periods of time is akin to torture. Um, and so people in detention are very fearful of this. They're fearful of being tested for COVID for fear that they're going to be put in solitary confinement. Um, and so that's a big problem right now. Uh, we do know that within the various uh, detention centers around the United States, there have been many people who have participated and are currently participating in hunger strikes. And that just gives you a little bit of an idea of how bad it actually is in there that people will go to that uh, extreme level of protest where they will, you know, go on hunger strikes because that's how bad it is in detention um, to try to bring uh, attention to what's happening. One of the biggest issues that has been uh, an issue even before COVID, and that's something that Doctors for Camp Closure has been focusing on a lot, is that these facilities, all of the facilities, so CBP, ICE, and ORR, um, have no independent medical oversight. So what does that mean? That means that they're basically allowed to police themselves. Um, they do employ some healthcare professionals and those healthcare professionals work within their systems. Um, but that means that there's no transparency. So there's no outside independent organization of medical professionals that can go in and um, see what's going on from a medical point of view um, and, and provide any kind of oversight. And we know that uh, ICE and CBP also don't follow their own guidelines um, for medical treatment for people. And because of that, the if you look at um, what the biggest abuses uh, are within these detention facilities, when we ask people who have been released from detention, overwhelmingly, uh, statistically, they say that medical neglect is the biggest um, issue within detention facilities. Um, going back to how ICE moves people around from facility to facility and also to, depo uh, to deport them, we know that they, they actually admit to only testing symptomatic people. So there's no universal testing right now um, for people in detention, and that's a dangerous situation. Elise, can you advance next slide? Thank you. Uh, so just a quick um, word about what's also going on on the southern border of the United States. Um, we do, within our organization, uh, work with physicians who volunteer and run uh, clinics on both sides of the border. Um, and so according to the, those physicians, uh, one of which I just spoke to last night, um, basically the U.S. border has been closed to all non-citizens um, since about March. And so what th that means is that there's been no court dates for people um, who are seeking asylum. There have also been no medical vulnerability exemptions. So um, we spoke a little bit about MPP earlier, which is the Remain in Mexico policy. So one of the stipulations of MPP were that people who had a medical uh, exemption, so if they had a, a complicated medical issue, were supposed to be exempt from MPP, meaning they were supposed to be allowed to enter the United States while their asylum uh, cases were ongoing. Um, that wasn't universally happening before, and we had done a lot of advocacy around that. However, it's not happening at all now. Um, so people with very complex medical issues are still being uh, told to stay in Mexico and are not being allowed through the border. Uh, the major outbreaks of COVID right now are in Mexico City and also in Tijuana. Uh, and Tijuana has many shelters for people who are stuck on that side due to MPP. Um, and those shelters are all now closed to new residents. So anybody who is now arriving in Tijuana cannot find a uh, shelter because they've closed in order to try to ameliorate the spread of COVID. Um, the other thing that has happened is that uh, migrants who and asylum seekers who were waiting in Mexico due to MPP were actually able previously to find some jobs. Many of them have gotten apartments and got housing. 
uh, once the COVID lockdown started, many of those people lost their jobs and then um, subsequently lost their apartments. And so now they are homeless and they also cannot go into the shelter. So there are tons of people who are now um, newly homeless in Tijuana. Um, there are multiple nonprofit organizations that are stepping in over there. They're doing things like opening hotels to house the homeless, um, setting up quarantine tents outside of shelters, um, even giving out debit cards so people can buy food or uh, pay their rent. And the other bi big issue in Tijuana specifically is that the major public hospitals in Mexico have been designated as COVID only, so only uh, treating patients with COVID. And the private hospitals were supposed to take over for other emergencies and other medical treatments that are still happening, things like heart attacks, uh, births, accidents, things like that. However, they have not been um, doing that. And so the clinics who are seeing patients have nowhere to send their patients if they need hospital care. So that's been actually a bigger problem uh, right now in Tijuana than COVID specifically. Elise, can you advance the slide? Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to uh, give you a little bit of an overview about uh, Doctors for Camp Closure, otherwise known as D4CC, um, and what we've been doing. So uh, we're part of the Families Belong Together a Coalition. Families Belong Together is a coalition of 250 organizations in the United States. <clears throat> it was started in 2018 in response to uh, the Family Separation Zero Tolerance Policy from the Trump administration. Uh, D4CC, uh, we consider ourselves nonpartisan. We're an activist group of physicians and healthcare professionals. We were founded in July of last year, so we're relatively new. However, uh, we ha now have 3,000, over 3,000 members um, across the United States, and that includes over 2,500 physicians specifically. Uh, and we have over a dozen active local chapters around the United States in places like Sacramento, Seattle, uh, New Jersey, and uh, other cities. And we uh, have done a lot of advocacy around um, healthcare and uh, the, the fact that no detention is safe for physical health and also for mental health. Um, and so, what we the um, approach that we take is sort of a what we call an inside outside approach. So we've done a lot of things like lobbying. Um, we have connections with the U.S. Uh, some U.S. congressional offices as well, and we've been. Um, helping them sort of write letters to CBP and advising them on the medical issues in detention. Um, but we also have done a lot of public protesting. So one of the biggest um, issues in the United States right now is because the administration is so, uh, does not um, respond uh, to lobbying or, or to advice from medical professionals is that one of the things that we found is actually more effective right now is, is sort of, um, shaping public opinion. And so we've done a lot of um, street actions to try to bring awareness to these issues um, to the general public in the United States. Um, in America, it's very easy to not be aware of a lot of the things that are happening on the border or in detention. Um, many of our physician members were undocumented children themselves. Um, and so they come from a very personal place for that and I'm happy to answer any questions about uh, D4CC that um, other people may have. Um, the next slide just has some information about how you can find out more about us. Um, Elise, can you, thank you. Um, so the, the biggest place to find out uh, more about us is our Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash doctors for camp closure. We also have a Twitter and a website and an email address as well. Um, so the, the things that we do, um, are not only lobbying and public actions, but we also are doing things like collaborating uh, with legal um, immigrant rights groups to write letters for people who are currently in detention. Uh, and we also have been volunteering at the clinics on the border. So we do a lot uh, of different activities. Uh, so that's all I have, and I'm happy to answer uh, any questions from, from Elise or Matthew or the audience. Bonnie, I, I wondered, obviously there's a, there's a lot to do here, to say the least, but I wondered uh, if you have any primary tech needs too as an organization or, or any, we have quite a big tech audience, or anything you found useful from a tech perspective that you want to develop or develop well? 
Um, yeah, so we have been um, actually as an organization discussing how we can gather more data. So one of the biggest questions that um, has been posed to us when we've spoken to various congressional offices is, you know, what are the numbers? What is what is actually happening? How many people are in detention who are being denied medical care? And so we have been um, looking into how to build a database, um, because as we know, ICE and CBP will not um, volunteer those numbers uh, readily, and the numbers that they do volunteer are likely not accurate. Um, and so one thing that we've been working on is um, building a database. We haven't actually uh, started doing that yet. Um, there's still a lot of uh, technicalities to figure out. Um, but that's one of the hopes as an organization that we will be able to start doing that to a lot of our um, members do treat people who have recently been released from detention. And they're so anecdotally seeing a lot of stories of people who've experienced medical neglect in the detention centers. Um, and so we are interested in, in uh, looking for a way to, to quantify um, that anecdotal data that we have right now. Thank you so much, Bonnie. Um, we really appreciate your talk. And we, as you said, please can everybody go follow Doctors for Camp Closures on social media. Their content is great. I would highly recommend it. And you guys should all follow it up. One last super quick question. Um, just wondering, because of the MPP and the border closure, can American doctors still go to the other side of the camp, um, the border, and treat yes. people in Mexico? That's a great question. Uh, the answer is yes. So um, we have uh, a significant am amount of members who are traveling on an almost daily basis across the border, specifically in Tijuana, uh, also in uh, Matamoros. Um, so do American doctors are able to cross the border back and forth um, to render assistance if they're interested in doing that. Thanks so much. Um, we really appreciate your intervention. And now we're going to move on to Matthew and Marcella. Hi, Marcella. So, Marcella, I'm writing saying from Connect to Doctors. And I'm sure she'll appear in a minute. Connect to Doctors is a um, well, technological solution around connecting to doctors. They have some very intriguing um, piece on prescription as well, using blockchain. So looking forward to talking about that. Thank Just in the Mar pleasure. Sorry, Marcella. Can you hear me? All right. Great. Um, Elise, should I present or do you? Um, as you wish. Would you like me to do it? Yes, thank okay. you. Cool. Um, well, thank you so much. My name is Marcela Valiente. I'm from Connect to Doctors. Um, so I did a little bit of a presentation so you could know more about the app we have. Um, I put some numbers. However, uh, the two panelists before me had a lot of information, a lot of data. So you would know the situation, how it is right now. Um, I'm trying to get on your... Yeah, we're, we're waiting for the presentation, Marcella. Yeah. I'm, if, if, oh, I'm sure. I think... No worries. This is on it. Cool. I to wonder, close, yeah. sorry. It should... I can put it. Let me... Okay, there we go. Sorry. Mine was working. Do we have it? Charlotte was when you were doing it? Yeah, don't worry. Right, cool. Awesome. Thank you for waiting, everyone. Appreciate your patience. All right. Okay, so can you see the presentation now? Yes. Yes. Great. So uh, here is some of the numbers uh, as the two panelists before uh, told us, but here's the thing that most of the people as we talk about in a no regular migration situation in Mexico and in the US, they, without any legal permission, they have no right to health services at all provided by the state. Um, as you can see the numbers, uh, Mexico is also the second largest migrant or Asian country in the world after India, so the numbers are really uh, considerable. 
what is the solution we have uh, tried to do in order to give access to health? First of all, um, we are a platform for telemedicine and also prescription planning. Right now, because of the COVID situation in on March 16th, the Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA, published an information providing guidance relating to the COVID-19 public health emergency, including the ability to prescribe controlled substances via telemedicine without a prior in-person exam. This is a really huge step, and even though U.S. has really stepping forward into the telemedicine and also another technology advancements within the health sector, this is a really positive um, point to provide access health to popul uh, vulnerable populations. For example, right now also within the COVID situation around the world, in Kenya refugee camps and in the bad in Kakuma, the CTV is transitioning into a health format with counselors speaking to survivors and also with the um, uh, with positive cases of COVID. What is Connect to Doctors? Well, Connect to Doctors is we see basically a platform where we try to solutionate most of the access through health for doctors, patients, and the uh, users as well. For example, we are not only trying to do the telemedicine and the online prescription that we did on blockchain, which right now it's open source, but we are also um, gonna release in two months the automatization of the follow-up of the treatments and the possibility to buy and the delivery medications at home. What is that? What you can see on the app today is basically the video call consultations. We have two types of consultations. One is for a general doctor. The second one is um, for specialists. The one where you can do a um, general doctor is, is working as an Uber. So you can picture kind of a, the process where you enter, you ask for a medical doctor, a general consultation, you pay for it and you can have the consultation. But with the specialist, you do kind of in an, in an agenda where you select the date, the hour, and the specialist so you can have the online consultation. Um, also, within the entire platform, we have the generation of the medical history, which is a clinical record. Also, um, as, you, as I told you, one of the innovations we have been working in Mexico specifically uh, is the generation of a medical prescription which is registered in blockchain. Um, this ensures the validity and the consumption of the prescription itself, and also the traceability and transparency without exposing any private data. Um, there have been a lot of efforts to do uh, blockchain prescription around the world. However, in Mexico, we created the first open source code. This is one of the reasons um, that we have grown in the few years because um, what we want is to democratize this type of uh, technology, not only for the business model we have, but also for other entities as enterprises, government, uh, NGOs, etc. so they can use this type of uh, technology so more people, especially vulnerable populations, can have access to prescriptions and to medicines. And finally, obviously, we have the virtual platform uh, for payment. 
Uh, coming soon, as I told you, in two months, Lent, we'll have the automation of the follow-up of the symptoms with uh, reminders. This is really important also for people with chronic diseases and also with people who are elderly because the reminders and also um, the people who will watch them, in this case, it can be either a family or another doctor, you can follow up how this person is having their treatment uh, done. And finally, the purchase of medicines and home delivery, which is another uh, point that is really, really good. I'll, I'll talk to it uh, about it a bit later. Um, oh, I don't know what is happening. Sorry. No Sorry. worries. Let me move on in a second. Yes, there you go. So what have been doing and what we have done and what is um, what we're trying to do is simply with this pandemic is um, because of the refugee status, the immigrant and the returnees also, the delicacy of the legal status and the paperwork they have to have in order to get access to health is really low or even none. So, uh, and also their clinical record is nowhere to find. This type of technology has allowed us to provide this population the, 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 the possibility to, to have their clinic records and also the access to health. Um, also, we have been developing and in, inside the platform also a technology where we can at some point in a year or we hopefully in a year, so we can provide an automatization with AI for uh, the pre consultation. So they will have the basics access to health without even going to a doctor itself. This it's like a, sorry, Marcelo, like a diagnostic tool. Yes, exactly. Okay. Having another diagnostic um, tools in the UK, there are several. So one of the biggest ones is ADA. And well, this is something we're trying to do with the, um, with this technology in, in, in our platform. Um, how is that we work as a social enterprise? So as Connect to Doctors, we kind of um, donate the facility of using the technology. We also have volunteers of doctors who um, will, they, they provide hours so they can um, give access to this consultation for migrants. And also in some cases we have had some uh, programs specifically with um, partners and sponsors, which they pay for the program, or in these cases, we have found um, allies who have helped us a lot to provide inside the technology so the people could go through the platform as tablets, as telephones, as uh, computers, and internet, because it's really well, it's kind of difficult for all of them to have this type of, of access. So uh, the cost of having a medical consultation is in really low. It's one for five dollars or um, free in some cases where we can actually have um, uh, the, the sponsorship so we can create the, the entire project. Um, what has been our validation towards doing this type of program with the vulnerable populations? Well, as uh, we have been one of the finalists of the Tech for You Summit 2018 in France with you guys. And the second one is um, last year we won the SAP Innovation Marathon here in Mexico. And also uh, we were finalists in the International in New York. Um, basically, we have proven all of these with social input projects to get access to health. So, um, where do we stand with the COVID-19 here in Mexico and our platform, Connect to Doctors? 
we have been doing some um, kind of different work approach because the telemedicine part here in Mexico is really um, difficult to work with. For instance, it is not regulated. It's one of the countries where this is this technology is not regulated to the health sector. Secondly, um, ab there are absolutely no protocol howsoever, so you can manage this type of technology. So we created an emergency protocol to receive possible cases within the platform and also uh, the emergency protocol to follow up the treatment of possible cases or cases who have been proven positive and also to uh, connect these cases with the federal protocol which is, exists, right? Um, all of this has been working with the virtual medical advice, which is a clinical um, consultation. Also, another thing that has been growing really, really uh, strongly with the pandemic has been the virtual psychology advising. Um, this has been a huge uh, deal that most of the people are not realizing of a consequences of being in their homes or losing jobs or having, you know, not mon no money to eat whatsoever, right? So it's a really huge consequence. And well, also we have been able to lower our costs to the platform so more people could have the access to an online consultation. Um, furthermore, we, because of the same issues we have seen in Mexico of the pandemics. Um, not in a legal status, but in the... Exactly, the tests and the protocols for the... Oh, sorry, we have someone um, asking in French. I, I wonder, I think they're muted now. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll respond to any questions. I'll, I'll... Sure, I got a few. I know we're running quite to towards the edge because we had so much brilliant content today i got a few questions if i could ask the audience perhaps could you hang on for another three minutes i think that will be how long it takes to get through our questions but um master i don't want to interrupt you anymore as you as you sum up on your presentation that's fine no worries it's just one slide more and that's it sure. well there's <laughs> so much to say you know yeah, yeah yeah no worries uh well here's the thing that um because I told you there is no regulation whatsoever, either on the telemedicine part. However, here in Mexico, the legal prescription on online, it's allowed. However, it hasn't been exactly adopted uh, either by the government or the private enterprises, such as pharmaceutical companies or pharmacists, not because they cannot do it, but the entire logistic part has been really hard because of the security issues we are facing here in Mexico. So right now, um, from our part, we have reached several pharmaceutical companies and pharmacies so they can adopt our protocol and we have had some really good uh, answers. So this way we could have not only the vulnerable populations, but the terror populations in Mexico, so they don't expose themselves with going with the doctor and also in the uh, with the pharmacy, but they could have this entire access to the medication and the consultation online. So this is a positive impact with the legal, legal compliance here in Mexico. And um, well, it's a new model which we Hopefully, we will open it in a in a few weeks. And finally, well, I'll show you the slide where you can see our platform, which is connecttodoctors.com, and you can access through the web app. We have also the Android right now. Um, we haven't been able to um, do the iOS because, as I told you. This type of technology is not regulated in Mexico and mostly because of the blockchain we have. It has been kind of a pain to pass this type of... Um, Do you find, Marcelo, that most of your users are using Android anyway? Yes. Okay. Most of yeah. them are, are Android. Yeah. So, so it's okay. 
and that's it so well, wonderful a, a lot of work it's incredible first of all i wonder we have to be quite quick because we're summing up but i wonder how have you built this you know in in three words or three sentences how have you grown everything to this point you've done a lot of work yeah uh, people think that doing like the telemedicine part is easy because we have seen a lot of type of platforms however easy to use yeah however it's really <laughs> hard. different to build yeah but i think the hard part is to endure the reviews from the patients and from the doctors that what works for them and what actually is having an impact so for us it has been up to three years since we actually started like the design of the project and as you can see we are half through not only we are not done so no. um it's okay. it's been quite a challenge but it's been really good like <laughs> excellent and i wonder there's a question too about which protocols doctors follow when they require a um, test results which ones they do they follow then to uh, be able to generate a diagnosis and prescription with? Yes. Uh, are, there, are there many? Or how do you handle that to you? Here's the thing, because we're in Mexico uh, until last week, uh, 10 years, 10 years, sorry, 10 days ago, the quick test for COVID uh, that wasn't allowed in Mexico uh, national wide. Before, the only um, test that was allowed was a PCR which only like 20 labo laboratories national wide had the permission to do this type of test. So we made an alliance with a few of them. And in the case, one of the um, patients was a possible case of COVID. We either, if they had the monetary um, kind of support, they would have the uh, lab laboratory go to their house so they could be tested. And if not, then we go through the federal protocol to send them to um, a public hospital. But in the case of a migrant, for example, or a refugee, it's really hard if they didn't have any papers because they couldn't go. So the protocol was to treat them because there is no cure and also the medication is, well, it's accessible. We try to put them through this protocol of prevention, having in mind that it could be a possible case. Okay, thank you for that. And I wonder, um, another question is how do you get involved? Somebody's asked, what, what they can do to get involved to help you? Or, or again, my favorite question, what's your primary need? First of all, to be known. <laughs> we have had a hard time so people could um, know what we do. Also, the benefits of our technology, we can be escalated not only by us, but for any ally we could have. And secondly, um, just to help us through in any way. For example, if uh, you have an NGO and do you want to do a social project with us, we can work it through. If you're a doctor, that would be amazing because we could have another volunteer through our platform so we can do more uh, accessible consultations online. Also, um, I think right now, what I think you could have a really breakthrough in Mexico is the validation of the protocol of the blockchain prescription. So this could actually change the way we work within the access to health in several conditions. Are you talking about engineers, Marcela? Not really. Uh, yeah, could be, yeah. Always, yeah, always engineers, <laughs> but first of all. Uh, that could work if, for example, an NGO wants to wrap her um, open source um, code. So it could help to integrate both of, um, of the projects that, that, that will do a lot of work. Okay. Um, but also just to 
get to know the platform so we can do a lot of more uh, impact within. Awesome. So publicity, doctors, engineers, and people around blockchain. Okay, there are four things. And they can, everyone can find you. It sounds to me like you brought a lot of people together with this technological piece as well. I think something's often overlooked. Uh, tech crosses barriers, and I think you can bring groups together and do a lot of offline work too. Um, so people can find you at doctors, connect to doctors, with a two in it, right? Yes. Connect to um, doctors.com. Exactly. Yes, and as you can see on the um, screen, the uh, social media it's underneath. Okay, awesome. And is that all on your connectedoctors.com? Yes. There are, okay, cool. Uh, all right. Well, thank you so much. Apologies, everybody. We ran over a little there. We covered a lot of ground. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you for all of your excellent input. Thank you, everyone, for listening and hanging on too. I'm sure uh, maybe Elise has another question. I'm sure. Plenty of questions can be answered too. We're happy to forward them through TechFugees. You can put them on the chat now. You can find us at techfugees.com or our Facebook group, TechFugees on Facebook. So please, if you have any questions, come there. And we also have our mapping project, which is techfugees.com, mapping COVID-19 impact. But just go to techfugees.com, you'll find everything from today. So please do join us for our next session when we'll be traveling around the world in about two weeks time. Details will be sent out from that. And if you have any questions, go through to Tech Fugees. At least, do you have any final words? I want to thank everybody for participating. Thank you to our great speakers. Um, this wouldn't have been able been um, possible without you. And I know everybody was very interested. Thank you to Matthew and Louise and the whole Tech Fugees team for supporting this and answering my calls every day for help. Um, and thank you to everybody listening for take time in your friday evening morning afternoon to come listen to us speak about what we've been working on and it's always nice to have people listen to our work so thank you great. and we hope you check out the data hub thank you go to the next live session it's great thank you great. look forward to staying in touch thank you bye 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 thank you bye bye